Welcome to Goobertown Hobbies. My name is Brent. Today we'll be talking about strategies to create beautiful and practical paint schemes. The ideas in this video can be applied to any project that you're working on, but I'll have some dinosaurs up here on the screen to look at while we chat. To me, this is a logic puzzle. We start with blank minis. We take them through a series of painting steps, and hopefully we end up with finished minis that look nice and make us happy. The challenge is to pick the steps in this recipe. We want the plan to be practical, efficient, and to give us good results. Ideally, we also want the process to be fun. The colors, the techniques, and the order of these steps can all make a big difference. Planning a color scheme and the recipe to get there can be a puzzle, and I figure there are three basic ways of solving it. 1. Start at the beginning and work forward. 2. Start at the end and work backwards. 3. Start in the middle and solve the hard parts first. I've actually made videos that touch on the first two, but as time goes by, I'm realizing that I really like that third middle out strategy. Realistically, I think we all use a combination of these, and I think they each offer some unique insights. Let's take a look at this and see if we can unlock some good ideas. Alright, strategy one. Start at the beginning and work forward. This is a tactile, dive-on-in kind of approach. Get some minis on your painting desk, put some paint on your brush, and do some trial and error. Just see how it goes. At first glance, this might seem like this is the complete absence of a plan, and it kind of is, but here's the advantage. Putting paint on a mini is the best way to explore it and understand it. At first, I didn't see that these lizards wear a layer of under armor between their scales and those big metal plates. Some of the spikes on these models are part of the armor, and some of them are dinosaur horns that are actually part of the characters. On the geckos, I didn't realize that they were wearing helmets until I started painting them. Every model is going to have details that you won't see until you get in there and work with it. This is the fastest way to understand how many color blocks you're dealing with and what their relative distribution on the model is like. There's a chance that you'll find some critical details. Maybe there are gems, or plasma coils, or magic runes, or something else that can glow a bright color and completely change the direction of the paint scheme. The sooner in the process you find those key details, the better. I do some of my best thinking when I'm painting a model. Moving paint around can be a meditation. While I'm putting on the first color, I have a lot of time to consider what color I want to put on next. When I'm putting on the second color, I have a lot of time to ponder how that third color might fit in. So the dive on in and get started method is smarter than it might seem. The tactile approach will also teach you how your paints, your tools, and your skills really interact with your model. Each model is a unique landscape of challenges and possible advantages. You may notice that a certain texture on the model takes a wash or a dry brush really well. Or not. Each bottle of paint is different. There's no substitute for actually taking paint from a bottle that you own, putting it on your model, and seeing how it looks when it dries. In this star host army, each type of lizard is getting a different color of scales. By the time I started painting these saurians, I already liked the gator green and the gecko teal. I wanted a color for the saurians that would fit in well, so I tried a bunch of colors, I saw how the minis actually looked standing next to each other, and I found some good candidates. Okay, so trial and error can be a great way to learn, but it can also take a lot of time, and in this case, a lot of models too. Now these dinosaurs are 3D prints from One Page Rules, and it's relatively cheap and easy to just print out some extras. I also have a habit of buying lots of janky used models, so I generally have extra test models around. Alternatively, there's no reason why we can't just repaint the same model multiple times. It's just paint. You can always paint over and try again. There's even the option to strip all the paint and get back to a fresh mini. I use a degreaser like Super Clean or LA's Totally Awesome. Alcohol can also work pretty well. If you're just painting a one-off model, then it probably makes more sense to just paint the dang thing rather than mapping out a whole plan. Take it one color at a time, and see what grows. On the other hand, sometimes it's nice to actually have a plan. I can totally understand if you don't want to play trial and error on your expensive minis. Some folks like to measure twice and cut once, 
and I can respect that. Let's look at the work backwards technique of developing a paint scheme. This is all about knowing where you want to go, and then doing a bit of reverse engineering to figure out how to get there. The simplest example is just copying a color scheme that you like. There is so much great inspiration out there. If your perfect paint scheme already exists, then you don't need to invent it. Maybe you want to copy something directly, or maybe copy something but swap out one or two colors. Maybe you really like the box art. You have an image of your final destination. You know what colors you want on each part of the model. It's just a matter of deciding what order to color things in. You can also use a computer to help you design a color scheme. Get an image of your mini and turn it into grayscale. Then use Photoshop or an art program to start coloring it in. I use PowerPoint. PowerPoint is not ideal, but hey, at least I know where most of the buttons are. Give the color layers a bit of transparency so that you can see the contrast from the black and white picture underneath. You can cycle through color options very fast on the computer to get some ideas of what might look cool. If you want, you can even import the color palette from paint lines that you own. I'm painting these lizards with Pro Acryl from Monument Hobbies. I can just grab a digital swatch of their colors and then use the eyedropper color picking tool to put those hues on the mockups. As another option, you can just print off some pictures of your minis with a black and white printer and then pull out your crayons or colored pencils. You can do a bit of coloring yourself, or you can outsource the whole color scheme development to some neighborhood children. All of these methods are faster than painting physical minis, and they all have an added bonus of not clogging up your favorite models with paint that you might not like. We're spending the extra time figuring out where we want to go. Having this concrete vision of our goal can be extremely useful. We know what colors we want and where to put them. From here it's just a matter of working backwards and figuring out how to apply each of those colors to make them look good. Okay, on to the third method which might actually be my favorite. This is the middle out strategy, and it's all about identifying and prioritizing the most important and impactful steps. I want to find the best opportunities and avoid the biggest pitfalls. Often a single color can make or break the model. If we find a recipe to get one or two of the main colors looking good, then the overall model is gonna be nice. Dinosaur scales and space armor can be pretty much any color. These are the biggest areas on these models, and they're the most important. Straps and under armor and claws and stuff like that are not critical. That'll all work itself out. I'm not planning on glowing weapons, so we don't need to worry about those. They'll be black or gray or steel metallic, and they'll look totally fine. Oh, but I do want glowing energy shields, so for the geckos, I've gotta get those sorted out. Lizard skin, space armor, and energy shields. If we crack those, then we should be in good shape. We wanna pick colors and techniques that are practical and look cool. I can make green gator skin with an airbrush, or a dry brush, or a colored wash, or with 10 careful layers of glazes and highlights. Of course there are trade-offs to each of those. This starts to be a puzzle because for some techniques the order matters. Applying washes, or dry brushing, or airbrushing can all be messy. We can be messy early in the process, but later on we usually need to be more careful. For the geckos, I started with a messy step the airbrush. I got a purple to blue to teal fade on the lizard skin. It's beautiful and it looks organic. That takes care of the first major color. I used tin foil as a mask so that I could get a red to orange fade on the energy shields. That's a good start on the second major color. There were a few mistakes. A bit of red got on the arms and on the hands, but not too bad. Then, as a minor bonus, I also got some black on the bases. This is about the limit of how much I could do with an airbrush. This is a bit messy, but it's quick, and it's a great way to start two of the most important colors. The trade-off is that now the armor needs to be done with a brush, and that could be tricky. Actually, it could be a disaster. Painting white or off-white is not trivial. White paint can be chalky, and it often requires multiple coats. This is a critical step, 
and if it doesn't work well enough, then we need to go back to the drawing board. I did some test models to see if painting off-white with a brush would give acceptable results. I tested out three different off-white colors from Pro Acryl. Pro Acryl White has a good reputation. These were all better than expected, but I thought that the one called Bright Neutral Gray gave the best results with the fewest number of coats. Painting the armor by hand works well enough. Not great, but good enough. So in those test models, we prioritized the skin and the shields, and we made do on the armor. Alternatively, we could prioritize the armor by putting that light neutral gray through the airbrush. If I didn't have an airbrush, I probably would have bought a light gray can of primer and used that to prime the whole army. If we spray the light gray, we'll get a nice smooth coat for the armor. But then, we'll need to paint the scales by hand. The good news is that most colors brush on pretty well over this light gray. The bad news is that we can't get an easy color fade on the scales the way that we could have with an airbrush. As a fast highlight, I tried dry brushing the scales. Before or after dry brushing would both be a reasonable time to give the scales a wash. But honestly, I think these look pretty good without any wash at all. Scales are good for dry brushing. The drawback is that dry brushing is messy and we'll need to do a bit of cleanup on the armor. But overall, I think this approach works pretty well. For the gaiters, I used Silly Putty as a mask so that I could get a start on both the scales and the armor with my airbrush. It wasn't practical to perfectly mask off everything, but this is a viable way to get a pretty good start on the two core colors. For some models, sub-assemblies may be a better option than masking. Painting two bits separately and then putting them together later may save you a bunch of trouble. The point of all of this is that there are trade-offs to every step, and the way that you order them matters. Give it some thought, and try to be clever. In my test models, I focused on the critical colors and the critical steps. I think that I got some solid, passable solutions. On the energy shields, though, I think I found a recipe that is better than just passable. I think these are a big success. Airbrush a red to orange transition. Then, black line between the hexagons. Finally, highlight with orange and yellow on some of the top edges of those hexagons. This little recipe makes the shields look great, and they really improve the look of the overall model. This is the middle out strategy. Solve the most important parts, and everything else will fall into place. The straps on the armor are brown. The pistols are dark gray. Who cares? The shields look great, so the models look pretty good. The middle out strategy is partially about optimizing the most important colors in the model. We can also prioritize fun steps. Painting should be fun. Include some techniques that you enjoy or that you want to try out. I knew early on that I wanted to do a lot of black lining on these lizards. I like the clean look of skipping washes and just using black to give some definition to the shapes. Regardless of anything else, I like this technique and I wanted to use it. Something I'd never tried before is using 3D printer supports as rubble on the bases. I feel bad about just throwing them in the trash, and they look kinda cool. I just wanted to give this a try, so I made it part of the plan. Whenever possible, I try to include something new in my recipes just to see how it goes. It is entirely reasonable to build your plan around a fun technique that you feel like trying. Maybe it's time to get some practice with wet blending, or freehand. Or perhaps you're in the mood for a lot of stippling. Maybe the time has come to mix up some oil washes. Middle out is deciding on core steps that are important to you and important to the paint job. Then you can build everything else around those key steps. So I've made a previous video about using PowerPoint to design a paint scheme and working backwards. I've also made a video about the emergent technique of starting with a blank mini and finding out what happens. Sometimes I start at the beginning, and sometimes I work backwards. But the more I think about it, the more I appreciate the middle out strategy. I spend a lot of effort contemplating and testing out those core steps. If I get a few steps that are clever and pretty, then I figure that everything else will work out okay. The Saurian star host models that I showed in this video are from One Page Rules. They were painted for a big exhibition game of Grim Dark Future. My opponent was Dave from Mini Wargaming Studios. That game was sponsored by One Page Rules and Monument Hobbies, and it was filmed by Cinecore Media. 
That's a team of actual professionals with a film studio and some serious gear. The goal was to make the best battle report ever filmed. I don't know about that, but we did have a robot moving a fancy camera around, and that's pretty cool. I did my best to make some nice looking Saurians. Depending on when you see this, that crazy over the top battle report may already be available for viewing. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this little meditation. Coming up with a good paint plan is a bit like solving a puzzle. Sometimes looking at a problem from a new angle will jiggle something in your brain and give you a good idea. I hope you have some great ideas for your next paint job, and I hope you have fun painting. Well that's about it for this time. Thanks so much for watching.